strange tales told me a Dubliner. Be Torloch con me. Story number seven. Lord Belvedere's murder. I went to school at a place called Belvedere. So did James Joyce, Harry Clark, and other Dublin luminaries. It was an elite school run by the Jesuits. Now the Jesuits always gave the name of some Jesuit saint to their colleges. But in this case, the building they had acquired was called Belvedere House, and so the name Belvedere stayed as the name of the college. When you walk up the stone steps from the street to the massive wooden door, you see a large brass plate inscribed with the words Belvedere College S.J. All I knew when I was going there as a boy was that the house had been built in the later 18th century as the townhouse of an Anglo-Irish nobleman called Lord Belvedere. By the time I was going there in the 1960s, the Jesuits had managed to build a whole school with junior and senior houses around the quadrangle at the back of Belvedere House, which latter was now used mainly as a residence for the Jesuits themselves. So we pupils didn't go in there much. I just have a recollection of a rather gloomy 18th century mansion with wide stairways and some reception rooms with stucco ornamentation on the ceilings, which were used for meetings. Many years later, I heard that Belvedere House was supposed to be haunted. It was haunted by the ghost of the First Lady Belvedere, who had a tragic life. But I never knew about this or the story of the Belvedere family. I certainly saw no ghosts there, all the time I was a pupil at Belvedere College. All my life I've wondered ironically at the name Belvedere. It's an Italian word, of course, Belvedere, and it refers to a building or vantage point from which a fine view is to be had. Now, this was certainly not true of Belvedere College. It was just a building looking out on other buildings in a rather run-down quarter of the city, though when it was built it may have had better views. But I knew that the name came from a previous owner, the First Lord Belvedere. I'll tell you his rather gruesome story, which explains why Belvedere House is supposed to be haunted by the ghost of his widow. That story took place long before Belvedere House was built. Robert Rochefort, the first Earl of Belvedere, came from a long-established Anglo-Irish family. They were originally Rochefort, for they were Normans by origin. They had their seat in County Westmeath, where he built himself a large country house. He married quite young, in the year 1731, but his first wife soon died of smallpox. In 1738, he married again, his bride being Mary Molesworth, the daughter of a local Anglo-Irish family, who was only 16 at the time. They had three children. But in 1743, it emerged that Mary was having an intrigue with Robert's own younger brother, Arthur. Now the extreme vindictiveness that was a part of Robert Rochford's character became clear. He sued his younger brother Arthur for crim con, criminal conversation, the legal term for adultery at the time, and obtained very substantial damages which Arthur could not pay. So he fled the country to avoid being put in debtor's prison. As for Mary, there was talk of transporting her to the colonies, but in the end the court consigned her to her husband to dispose of her as he wished. 
Under the legal system then, she was only a chattel. Robert proceeded to imprison her at the family seat, deprived her of her servants and even her children. After a few years, Arthur returned to Ireland under an assumed name and laid plans to rescue Mary from her imprisonment and elope with her to the continent. He got word to Mary of his return and she managed to escape from the country house in County Westmeath. But her own father wouldn't give her sanctuary and soon she was found and brought back to her prison. What was more, Arthur was captured too and cast into debtor's prison in Dublin. Robert Rochfort, now styled Earl of Belvedere, remained as vindictive as ever against his wife and his younger brother. Not for nothing was he known to all and sundry as the Wicked Earl. Mary continued to be imprisoned in the family mansion in County Westmeath, and Arthur languished in debtor's prison until he died there in 1774. Shortly thereafter, mysterious events took place at the family seat, which led to the sudden death of Lord Belvedere. It was long assumed he had been murdered, but no culprit was ever found. It was a calm evening in the autumn of 1774. Dinner had been served, and Lord Belvedere, now 66 years of age, took his usual constitutional in the gardens at the side of the country house overlooking Loch Enel, a long shallow lake at County Westmeath. The lake was calm and scarcely a wind caused it to ripple. The days were getting shorter as the year advanced. A pale full moon rose over the land, illuminating many features. It was then that Lord Belvedere saw something out on the lake. It was a small boat, and it seemed to be making for the jetty of Belvedere House. This aroused a strange sense of foreboding in the noble lord. He determined to see who was coming to visit him at this late hour, unannounced. As he walked down towards the jetty, he heard the splash of oars in the water. The boat was approaching, and in it was a solitary oarsman. Lord Belvedere stood on the jetty now, watching the boat come alongside. He couldn't tell who the oarsman was, for he was dressed in a dark cloak, and a dark broad-brimmed hat was pulled down over his eyes. The boat touched the wooden piles and stairs of the jetty, and the man threw out a rope around a post to steady the boat. He stood up in the boat then. "'Who are you there?' asked Lord Belvedere unsteadily. The man took off his hat. Arthur, cried Lord Belvedere in astonishment. Is it you? But it can't be you. You're dead. Arthur nodded grimly, but made no further reply. After a few moments of silence had passed, Arthur said, Get in the boat. No, said Robert, beginning to be assailed by panic. I won't. I don't want to. I don't know why you've come here. I've come here to put an end to this whole sorry business, Robert. It's the only way. Now, get in the boat. Robert trembled all over, but he seemed to be in a hypnotic trance, having to obey the commands of the other man. He walked unsteadily down the steps of the jetty and got into the boat. Arthur steadied him with one hand. Robert shivered, feeling the icy hand that held his arm. 
My God, groaned Robert, your touch is so cold. As well it might be, said Arthur. Sit down now. Robert sat down in the boat, facing his brother. Arthur released the painter from the post on the jetty and stowed it in the bottom of the boat. Then he gripped oars and rowed in a circle so that the boat was again facing the far end of the loch. The two men were silent for a long time. Where are you taking me? gasped Robert as he watched the lights of Belvedere House recede in the distance. Where are we going? We are going where I have come from, said Arthur, to the other side. At Belvedere House, the servants were perturbed to see that Lord Belvedere had not come back from his evening constitutional. Reasoning that he met an acquaintance on his walk and had gone off with him for a late night carouse or to play cards, they prepared his bed in the usual way and then went to bed themselves. All was quiet and dark at Belvedere House when the boat with the single oarsman again arrived. No one saw as he silently tied up the boat at the jetty and walked up the wooded path to the gardens. No one heard his footfalls as the figure in the dark cloak and broad-brimmed hat advanced up through the gardens and entered the house through the French windows at the side. Nor did the sleeping servants hear him as he strode through the empty halls and up the wide staircase till he reached the garret at the top of the house. Lady Belvedere awoke from an unquiet sleep to find a man in a dark cloak and a broad-brimmed hat pulled down over his eyes, standing just inside the door of her room. She shivered with dread. But then the man took off his hat and stepped into a pool of moonlight that shone through the skylight on the roof. Arthur! She said in a coarse whisper, Is this a dream, or is it you? It is no dream, dearest, said Arthur, his long familiar voice seeming to come from far away. It is I. She got up and went to him. She wanted to be held in his embrace, but the air around him was as cold as ice, so she stood there undecidedly. Have you come then to take me away with you? she asked. No, said Arthur sadly. We two cannot be together now. But I have come to tell you that you are free. The wicked Earl is no more. I have seen to it. It was the only way to end this tyranny. Now I must go and be gone before the night has ended, before the alarm is raised. But you, wait patiently for your deliverance. He stepped back into the shadows, turned, and was gone. The next morning, the servants knew that something was wrong, for Lord Belvedere had not reappeared. His bed had not been slept in. Messengers were dispatched to the nearby houses of the gentry to inquire if he had gone there, but to no avail. They were now very anxious about his whereabouts and his welfare because he'd quarrelled with many men and had many enemies in Westmead, and somebody might have settled a score with him by stealth. By the late afternoon, they put out a boat to search Loch Ennell, and just before dark, a body was seen floating out on the waters of the lake. When they pulled it in, they recognised it as Lord Belvedere. He was dead, presumably be drowning. There was also a wound on his head, seemingly from a blow with a heavy object, such as an oar. How he had got out there on the lake no one could tell. As the death was suspicious and foul play likely, the officers of the law in Westmeath were informed. They came and investigated. The servants were able to tell them little, except that Lord Belvedere had gone on his usual after-dinner walk, down through the gardens and the wooded path to the lake, as he usually did, but that he had not returned. Local tenants on the estate told them, however, 
of a boat that had crossed Loch Ennell after dark and had landed at the jetty of Belvedere House. It had been seen out on the lake not once, but twice or several times that night. They had heard the sound of the boat's oars in the silence of the countryside. Yes, there were men in the boat, but whether there were two or several, they couldn't tell for sure. The story grew up that a group of murderers had crossed Loch Ennell in the boat, lain in wait for the hapless Earl, murdered him, and thrown his body in the lake as they rowed away and made their escape. But no such group of men was ever identified. In the end, Lord Belvedere's sudden death was recorded as an unsolved murder. Lord Belvedere was succeeded in the title by his eldest son George, who had grown up unable to see his mother in her imprisonment, for the wicked Earl had determined that she was to be deprived of her children. George went to the family seat in Westmeath and immediately restored his mother to freedom. When he marched up the stairs to the top of the house and had the garret unlocked and the doors thrown open by the servants, she came out and looked at her son, not recognising him, for he was now a grown man and she'd never been allowed to see him. But she seemed already aware of what had happened, for she asked, Is the tyrant dead? It was, alas, a melancholy deliverance, for it was clear that the long years of confinement had affected Lady Belvedere's reason. She spoke in a strange, shrill whisper, and she made use of her newfound freedom to wander about the halls of the mansion. addressing soliloquies to the portraits of the Rochefort family hanging in the galleries, including the portrait of the wicked Earl himself, who had caused her so much suffering. At length, George Rochford decided to take his mother away from this accursed house, in order to preserve what was left of her reason. In the year 1775, he married. He was now well over 30 years of age and was still a bachelor. His two brothers never married. It seems their traumatic upbringing was enough to put them all off the married state. At any rate, George Rochford and his new wife decided to build a townhouse in Dublin on a plot of land that had previously been acquired be the first Earl for that very purpose. In the meantime, they went to England and the continent for two years, and Mary, Lady Belvedere, accompanied them on their travels. On their return to Ireland, they settled in the new Belvedere house in Dublin. Mary, Lady Belvedere, lived there with them. It was her last home. She died in 1785. When her son George Rochford, the second Earl of Belvedere, died in 1814, he was without issue, and his peerage became extinct. Belvedere House lay vacant, and was eventually acquired by the Jesuits for their new school. For whatever reason, the ghost of Lady Belvedere is supposed to haunt Belvedere House to this day. Perhaps our ghost feels bound to Belvedere House in Dublin, as the place of better times. Perhaps she found it best to leave the country seat in West Meath to the wicked Earl, whose ghost has been reported from there, in fact. But from the time of her deliverance, to her leaving the place of her imprisonment for good, she had already haunted the country seat in West Meath, apostrophising the Rochford family portraits in her shrill whisper, hardly meant for human ears. Having haunted one house as a living ghost, she chose to haunt a better one as a spirit from beyond the grave.
You have been listening to Lord Belvedere's Murder Be Torloch on Me from Strange Tales Told Be a Dubliner. If you enjoyed the story, don't forget to like, subscribe, share and comment. And so, until next time.